Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the remote and sparsely populated Canadian province of Saskatchewan. The beautiful location of McKee Lake is nestled among the innumerable lakes in the northwest part of the province. The area is practically one huge lake, interrupted by small stands of pine and fir trees. There are also birch and aspen trees as well. The terrain is rolling forests and beautiful lakes and ponds. There are moose, wolves, deer, and black bears in very high numbers. The fishing is amazing, and the recreational opportunities are endless, with canoeing being one of the favorites. Stephanie Blaze was 44 years old and visiting the family cabin for a week with her husband and two children. Her father, Hubert, had stayed at the cabin the prior week, and she needed to call him to tell him Curtis, her husband, had repaired the water pump. The Blaze family was well practiced at remote living and wilderness safety. Their only means of communication at such a remote location was by satellite phone, which required a clear view of the sky for the best connection. Stephanie and Ely, her nine-year-old son, went outside to talk with Grandpa. Once they walked the short distance to a nearby opening in the trees, Stephanie realized she'd forgotten the antenna needed for best reception and instructed her son to run back to the cabin and get it real quick. He scampered back toward the cabin, and Hubert listened once again to his daughter explain the water pump dilemma. Hubert was very proud of his daughter, and she gave him very good reason to be. She had completed her bachelor's degree in human justice and her master's degree in elementary education. Her passport had the stamp of 37 nations, and she taught school in Kuwait and Taiwan, as well as served on the UN Human Rights Commission in Geneva, Switzerland. There was no arguing about her intellect, but her personality was even more impressive. She was described as a loving person and a sweetheart by most who knew her. She was particularly important to her father as he lost her sister at 19 years of age in a car accident in the early 90s and his wife to breast cancer in 2008. They were brought closer by the tragedy in their lives. Hubert resumed listening to Stephanie after hearing her order Ely to fetch the antenna. Suddenly a strange gurgling noise broke through on the line. He called his daughter's name in an attempt to understand what was happening, but there was no response. The sounds coming from her end of the connection were grunting and growling noises, not words. This went on for a few minutes before Hubert hung up, thinking it may have been a connection problem. Hubert called his daughter back, but was not able to reconnect. A few minutes earlier, Ely had run to the cabin and grabbed the antenna and was on his way back to his mother's side, but as he approached, he could see a horrible sight. The nine-year-old boy saw the bear attacking his mother and turned and ran to get his father. The boy stammered out the situation to his father and Curtis grabbed a pepper spray and a gun. He sprinted to his wife and yelled and sprayed the bear with pepper spray in an attempt to run it off and stop the attack. The bear spray seemed only to enrage the bear, as it simply intensified its attack and stubbornly refused to leave his prey. Curtis knew he had to shoot the bear and fired once, but the bear continued the attack. Curtis fired a second shot and the bear dropped, ceasing the attack. Curtis immediately rendered first aid to Stephanie and noticed she was not breathing and had no pulse. He started CPR and then called Hubert for advice. After a considerable amount of time, Curtis realized he had done all he could do, and his wife and the mother of his children was now dead. Hubert and Curtis had authorities come out and investigate the attack and take possession of Stephanie's remains. The bear's corpse was taken and a necropsy was performed on it. It revealed the black bear to be a male and older for that area, but no other details could be found out about the bear. The attack was labeled an unprovoked and predatory attack. A GoFundMe page was created for the children and raised about $25,000 per child that their father indicated would go toward their education. Stephanie Blaze's attack was the first fatality caused by a black bear in Saskatchewan since 1983. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode whisks us away to about 100 miles north of Phoenix, Arizona, to a place just outside of Prescott called Groom Creek. 
It isn't exactly the back 40 here, as there are homes all around this rural development. There are even a few small businesses nearby. The terrain is hilly and covered with stands of spruce, pine, and juniper trees. There are an average of 300 trees per acre here, which is high density. The wildlife in the area includes mule deer, elk, pronghorn, antelope, turkey, and javelinas, to name a few. The dominant predators in this area include mountain lions, coyotes, foxes, bobcats, and black bears. It is in this scenic and peaceful setting that our episode takes place today. At 7.40 a.m. on Friday, June 16, 2023, 66-year-old Stephen Jackson was sitting down at a table on his rural property to enjoy a morning cup of coffee. He was building a cabin on some land he owned and was just beginning to plan his work day. He was from Tucson and recently relocated to his land in Yavapai County on a quiet wooded lot. Stephen had been camping here regularly and enjoyed the peace and serenity. Whenever he came up to work on his cabin, Stephen would sleep on a hard shell pop-up tent mounted on a rack over the back of his truck bed. It was made by a company called Roof Nest and was the state of the art in camping. It provided an elevated sleeping area which would be sure to keep you safe from any animals which may wander into your camp. It had a reduced vulnerability to being attacked by an animal like a bear, who would find a ground-based tent easy access, even though this kind of encounter rarely happens. Users describe this means of tent camping as granting a sense of security more than ground tenting it. Stephen's neighbor, David Montano, described him as extremely intelligent and very friendly. The two had exchanged phone numbers when they first met several years back and had been friendly neighbors ever since. Montano liked Jackson and enjoyed how happy he always was when he was up on his property. He and Jackson's other neighbors would while away hours on his property, chatting. He looked forward to the completion of Jackson's home and continuing to build their friendship. As Stephen prepared his coffee, he set up his typical morning ritual a comfy camping chair by his table only a few yards from his cabin site. As he relaxed, he had no way of knowing there would be a dangerous visitor to his site on this day. With Stephen's back facing the wooded part of his lot, he couldn't possibly have seen the very large male black bear approaching him. Bears have plantigrade feet, which means their weight is distributed over a larger area like human feet. Their feet have thick rubbery pads similar to dogs that flex around any object they step on. This may keep twigs from snapping or prevent other sounds while they approach their prey. While I was in the back country of Alaska, I once had an enormous brown bear shake the ground with thudding footsteps as he approached me, stop, then slip away without as much as a twig snap. Nobody witnessed precisely how the black bear closed in on Stephen, but his neighbors suddenly heard him yelling for help. They rushed outside to see Stephen in the grasp of a huge black bear, clearly terrified. Neighbors began flocking to the attack site. Many of them yelled and screamed at the bear, trying to frighten it off. Others got into their vehicle and approached the area, honking their horns, but none of it scared the bear away. As the bear bit and clawed Stephen, the man yelled and tried pushing the bear away from him. With all the din raised by the neighbors, the bear began to drag Stephen away, about 75 yards down a slope. That is when one of them went to get Montano. Montano worked for the government, and as part of his training, was well trained with firearms. He firmly believed that a firearm in the hands of a trained person can save lives, but on this day, he was painfully wrong. Montano was sleeping when he heard a thunderous pounding on his front door. He leapt out of bed and ran to the door to see what all the ruckus was about. As he opened the door, he witnessed an exasperated neighbor telling him to get his gun because a bear had Stephen. Incredulous, he scrambled to grab his rifle. By the time Montano arrived at Stephen's lot, he was nowhere to be found. Bystanders directed him to look down the hill, and he quickly made his way through the trees and down the slope. As he searched for Stephen, he could see the bear standing over him. The bear was eating Stephen's lifeless body and slowly dragging Stephen further away. He raised his rifle and fired once, and the bear immediately rolled off of Stephen. Knowing how a dead bear can quickly become a partly dead bear, he fired once more into the bear's limp corpse. Montano and other neighbors quickly called the Yavapai Sheriff's Department and requested medical help at the location. They ran to Stephen's side to see if they might be able to help him. Stephen was a mess, with large bite wounds, and was not responding to them. 
By the time the police arrived on the scene, they found Stephen had died from loss of blood and trauma. His smile was erased in his painful expression of death. Arizona Fish and Game Department officials showed up and completed a brief investigation. They indicated that there was nothing left out that would attract the bear to Stephen's lot. He hadn't left food out or spilled anything that a bear might find enticing. Stephen had followed the Be Bear Aware guidelines in terms of keeping a clean campsite free from trash and food. They also indicated there were no reports of an aggressive bear in the area. It seemed this bear had never shown up on their radar as a problem bear. They took the bear's body for a necropsy to gain insight into why this attack happened. The report indicated that the bear was very large, weighing 360 pounds. It had a good amount of fat and had no sign of illness or disease. A rabies test was performed on the bear and came back negative. Authorities labeled the incident a predatory attack and struggled to explain just why it happened. The bear's stomach contents were removed. It had tissues from Stephen's body mixed in with some seeds and plants it had consumed previously. At our Patreon link below, you will find pictures of the attack scene and the dead bear after Montano shot it. There are no pictures of Stephen's injuries there, but the pictures are always great to analyze for context. There is nothing particularly graphic there except the dead bear. Stephen's remains were removed and transported to the coroner's office for analysis, but it didn't take a medical professional to explain his death. Authorities thanked Montano for dispatching the predatory bear before it could hurt or kill anyone else. They said that they avoided having to conduct a hunt for the bear since it was killed at the attack site. His neighbors, friends, and family were saddened by the manner and suddenness of Stephen's passing. Montano recalled how Stephen was looking forward to enjoying his remaining time at his favorite place on Groom Creek, and now he will stay there eternally. Since 1990, 15 people have been attacked by black bears in Arizona. Stephen's attack was only the second human fatality in over 12 years. There are reportedly only 2,000 to 2,500 black bears in Arizona, which makes Stephen's attack even more puzzling. After reviewing the details of this episode, I have some questions for you. We have reported in our episode on bear repellents and attractants that bears are drawn to the smell of coffee grounds. Do you think it was Stephen's early morning cup of joe that brought the bear to him? Do you think bear spray would have prevented this attack? Does this attack show you that precautions like being bear aware around your campsite and sleeping in elevated accommodations are not enough to avoid a predatory bear attack? Are you surprised at the massive size of the bear that killed Stephen Jackson? I will enjoy reading and responding to your comments, so please post them below and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. When you think of Florida, you probably think of palm trees, sandy beaches, alligators, and sunshine. Many people from all over the world travel to its relaxing and warm environment to escape colder, more stressful locations. Perhaps you will rethink your opinions and vacation destinations after this report. Florida is home to its own unique subspecies of black bear known as Ursus americanus floridanus. The subspecies is remarkably robust with an estimated population of just over 4,000 bears statewide. Today's episode takes us to the central Florida town of DeBerry, just north of the entertainment mecca of Orlando. On January 13th of 2022, just after 8 p.m., Austin Kennedy was outside enjoying the fresh air when a black bear was observed walking through the area. Not a common sight, this drew the attention of the neighbors as they walked through the area. The female black bear and her three 100-pound cubs retreated up a nearby tree for protection. Neighbors Mike and Jenny were walking down the sidewalk. The mother bear shimmied down the tree and began aggressively approaching the couple. They began yelling and waving their arms to scare her off, and it seemed to work. They held their ground and kept their eyes focused on the irate mama bear. It was at that pivotal moment that Aidy exited her home across the street from the confrontation to take her dog for a walk down Madeira Street. The mama bear immediately redirected her attention to A.D. and her now-barking canine. At the sight of the aggravated bear, A.D. turned and ran away as fast as she could, a potentially deadly mistake. The sow quickly overtook her and leapt onto her back, slamming A.D.'s head against the ground, nearly causing her to lose consciousness. The bear began clawing her lower back and head, as well as biting her lower back, during the attack. The attack was over nearly as suddenly as it began, as neighbors alerted by A.D.'s screams converged to frighten the bear off. 
The bear and her cubs disappeared into the twilight, leaving Ady and her dog confused and terrified. Ady's dog disappeared into the night as well. Volusia County Sheriff's deputies were contacted and quickly responded to the incident. After a brief interview with Ady, the sow and her three cubs were observed hiding in the canopy of a nearby pine tree. Animal control officers used a tranquilizer gun to sedate the sow. The sow was euthanized per Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission policy based on her lack of fear of people. The three cubs were deemed able to survive on their own and were permitted to flee the area without being euthanized over the objections of A.D. A.D. expressed gratitude for receiving relatively minor injuries and that her dog was not injured during the confrontation. This is the 14th recorded bear attack in Florida since records began in 1976. Black bears were removed from the threatened species list in Florida in 2012 and now can be found over much of the state. Some of the names of the people involved in this video have been changed to protect their privacy. The top link in the resource article of this video links to the actual 911 call from a concerned neighbor. The link to the FWC below also provides human bear incidents listed on a map of the area. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.